everyone. Um, firstly, I just have to say how amazing it is uh, that we still have daylight right now here in Vancouver. Um, so beautiful. Thank you for joining us this evening for a very special edition of Insight. Tonight we have Eden Robinson in conversation with Angela Starrett and we're so glad you could be here. My name is Leah Tottenham. I'm from the Vancouver Public Library's Programming and Learning Team. I'd like to begin this evening by acknowledging that my home and the Vancouver Public Library are located on the traditional and unceded homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. This evening's event is part of Insight, Captivating Explorations of Books and Ideas, and this is a series presented in partnership between the Vancouver Writers' Fest and the Vancouver Public Library. I'm so glad to see so many of you here tonight, and I hope you'll join us for some other upcoming library programs. So on select Friday mornings until the end of April, we go live on YouTube with Uncanny Tales, which is VPL's new story time for adults. And just remember back how fun it was to sit and relax and let someone else do the reading. So we're bringing you back there. Our next installment is on Friday, March 26th, and we invite you to tune in for a live virtual reading of classic horror, mystery, and science fiction tales. More information about this and other events can be found at vpl.ca slash events, or by signing up for our email newsletter. And now please join me in a warm welcome as I pass things over to Leslie Hertig, Artistic Director of the Vancouver Writers' Fest. Thank you so much, Leah, and good evening and welcome everyone to this special Insight event tonight, featuring beloved and best-selling author Eden Robinson in conversation with Angela Starrett. We would like to thank our Insight partner, the Vancouver Public Library, for their collaboration and support on putting on these Insight events. Our thanks also go out to our government sponsors, the Government of Canada, the Government of BC, the BC Arts Council, the City of Vancouver, and CMHC Granville Island. This is our fifth Insight event of the season already. I, I can't believe that it's already mid-March, but here we are. And this is just a reminder to say that we'll be hosting events every other Wednesday between now and June, as well as some special events uh, coming up like another digital book club. Tickets are now on sale for our spring book club featuring one of America's most highly regarded contemporary authors, Viet Tan Nguyen, in conversation with Scotia Giller Prize winner, Ian Williams. Viet's new book, The Committed, is a follow-up to his Pulitzer Prize winning novel, The Sympathizer. And it's both a political literary thriller and a captivating novel uh, of ideas. This event will be taking place on Sunday, May 16th, and tickets are now on sale. We hope you'll join us for that. And mark your calendars now because our flagship festival will be returning in the third week of October. We don't quite know what that's going to look like yet. Might be a bit of a hybrid between some uh, in-person events and some digital events, but I know that it will be great. On to tonight. The event for tonight is fairly straightforward. I will soon be turning things over to Angela to chat with Eden about her brilliant new book. And then we'll be inviting you to submit some questions using the comment function. We will get to as many of those as possible before wrapping up in just a little over 75 minutes. And now please allow me to introduce our host for this evening. Angela Starrett is an award-winning journalist, author, artist, and keynote speaker. She's from British Columbia. She's worked as a journalist for close to 20 years and has been with the CBC since 2003. Angela is a member of the Gixan Nation and the Gitnamax First Nation. Our guest author tonight has visited us at the Vancouver Writers' Fest many times in the past, and we're thrilled to welcome her here again this evening to talk about the third and final volume of her best-selling and much beloved Trickster series. The new book is called Return of the Trickster. Eden Robinson is a Heisla Hiltzuk novelist who has a knack for weaving gloriously narrative stories featuring characters that sit with the reader long after the books are finished. I'm talking about Jared here. She has won and been nominated for multiple awards and sat atop bestseller lists and delighted fans right across this country with her storytelling and her warmth and her great humor. Uh, when writing this intro tonight, I turned to some bios that were posted by her publisher, both on the um, sleeves of the books, but also on their website. And each one carries a unique um, 
Well, her signature wit is on display in all of them. And I'm just going to read you a quick example of that wit from the Penguin Random House uh, website. Eden Robinson has matriarchal tendencies, doesn't have a pressure cooker, but knows how to jar salmon. Her smoked salmon will likely not kill you. Hobbies include shopping for the apocalypse, using vocabulary as a weapon, nominating cousins to council while they're out of town, chair yoga, looking up possible diseases or syndromes on the interwebs, perfecting gluten-free bannock, playing mahjong, be warned she writes novels, and tends to be cranky when interrupted. Please welcome Angela Sterrett and Eden Robinson. Hello. Hello. Okay, you can get Ulikins at the Kabodi Friendship Center at noon tomorrow. So. <laughs> do they come to Vancouver? Do they? <laughs> I think you'd have to work your relatives for that. <laughs> I, I was going to say shopping for the apocalypse, uh, chair yoga, like a lot of art. <laughs> right there. You well, we just got right now. Nice. we just got the nomination forms for our election in June and I was like ooh <laughs> <laughs> one of my cousins is currently uh taking a class in French George uh for the week and I was like yeah I, I can probably nominate her for chief counselor <laughs> <laughs> It is, it is such an honor to um, share space with you tonight, Eden. I am such a huge fan um, reading your most recent book, Return of the Trickster. Like I think everyone can say it's just so incredibly magical and rich and inspiring and dark. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I wanted to start off by just asking you, because I know you've been so busy, but it's also, we're in the middle of a pandemic. How are you doing? I, I'm doing good. I, uh, but I'm at the point in the pandemic where people were last March, like I'm a complete introvert. So I don't need like a lot of contact to keep me happy. But, you know, a year in, and I'm really starting to feel it. It's like, so, you know, so I'll be having long conversations with the grocery clerks or, <laughs> you know, our mail, the post office people, or, you know, it's like, hey, you, hi. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone else is in a completely different stage of the pandemic. And I'm, you know, finally going, oh, I actually do need people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I actually, I think a lot of people are like that right now because the sun is coming out and we're not in that like yeah. impending doom state of the pandemic. We're like, okay, we're just so like desperately. Um, but I want to, I want to talk about your book, of course. Um, I'm not actually a big fiction reader at all as a journalist. I'm constantly doing nonfiction yes. research. Yes. So this was one of the first books and I have to say, one of the first fiction books that I've read since Monkey Beach. Um, oh. <laughs> I love that book. And I love the, um, the spirituality of it. And that is just, I think, so relative to Indigenous people. And this yeah. one was like another dimension. Of <laughs> and I wanted to ask you that because I just watched an interview you did with Cherie Dimeline. Mm. And you talked about having this Eden level of darkness. What, what level of darkness? <laughs> is is this book do you think <laughs> this is written in the pandemic dark <laughs> so i have like i have like uh, like all these health issues that are uh comorbidities and um at the time that i was uh writing the second draft i was at the hague Run house in campbell river and had just had a class visit and one of the students in the class had come in, had gone to her dentist to get her teeth cleaned. And <laughs> um, her dentist had gone to a conference in Vancouver that turned out to be a super spreader. So we were all contacted and told to quarantine for two weeks. Oh. 
and Hank Brown House is so lovely. It's two acres of garden and, you know, the river on that side and the highway on the other. And I have like all these seasonal allergies. So I didn't know if I had COVID or if it was just, you know, the pollen and menopause. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> it's either impending doom or just, you know, like my own private summer. <laughs> Because, you know, my, you know, the temperature readings were like really far up there because I was, you know, I've been having hot flashes again all winter. Uh, so in the state of mind that, you know, this, you know, it's entirely possible that I could die. <laughs> you know, the very gentle first draft became like everyone in the second draft, like died. They died wow. horrible, gruesome deaths. And then the very last page, Jared died. And it was, you know, one of those lingering, agonizing deaths. <laughs> and, Spoiler alert. <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> so, so for the third draft, I was back home and I was quarantining for two weeks because I just had just arrived. And it was, it was a very different feeling because uh, like I was surrounded by family and my cousins were bringing me like fresh fish and fresh crabs and you know cockles and clams and you know I'd have lovely chats at the window so the third draft and spoiler alert not everybody dies and also like just so people don't have a spoiler alert I wasn't sure if Jared actually did die but <laughs> I'm still, y'all have to go back. And do that. But, but, but I wanted to know about that process because it sounds like it, it got a lot darker in the, in, in the third book. Yeah. But when you first started this trilogy, mm -hmm. this like humongous story, were you thinking this is going to be a trilogy? No, I thought it was going to be a longer book. Um, but when I was writing it, like there, there were such distinct moods to each of the books that I knew that it was either going to be like a thousand page novel <laughs> with three main like sort of segments. Well, at the time I thought it might be two segments. It was, it was, a, this was like uh, at the, like I'll step way back, like at the yeah. beginning I was writing uh, my Trashy Band Council romance. <laughs> and <laughs> Not in their life. <laughs> Who hasn't been there? <laughs> and it was it was getting really challenging because there were so many voices, and it was getting it was getting really large and unwieldy. Um, so I decided to take a short break and write a short story about a trickster, and he's the high the trickster we get. And when I was growing up, my you know, my family would sit around the kitchen table after dinner and, you know, I come from a family of storytellers. So they would just like, you know, feed off each other. And once they got going, you know, it was just laughing all night. Uh, and my favorite stories were always trickster stories. Uh, we get is a, such a nutty character and he gets into so much trouble. And uh, I love that wild, funny energy. And I wanted to put that <laughs> in a short story. <laughs> uh, but when I was writing the short story, like when we get was telling the story, it got pretty braggy pretty fast. Um, so I needed a Watson for my Sherlock. So I tried writing it from Maggie's point of view and um, it turned pretty much into a fight club. So, <laughs> Uh, there was a collection of link, interlinked short stories that I'd been tackling and that had stalled out at like the third short story. But a fragment of that was a young man arriving from Northern BC on the Greyhound. And he's coming into the Vancouver bus station late at night. And it was one of those like really lonely scenes that haunted me. So that's actually like, that's the piece that migrated over to the trickster story. And you know, once Jared entered the story, uh, it quickly went 50 pages. I went, oh, it's a novella. 
Uh, and then when it hit 400, I thought, yeah, it's a novel. <laughs> <laughs> and it was um yeah it was that was the very first time that I wrote in the morning like I used to be a morning person when I was a kid but most all my other books have been written at night and hmm. uh between 10 and 2 a.m um but you know life you get busy like I, I was finding that I didn't have enough energy to write anything at the end of the day so I thought well I miss writing I, I want to keep it up so uh when can I write and this the time you know between the adjuncting and the family and you know all the other stuff I was doing I had between 4 a.m and 5 a.m wow yeah <laughs> so early and such <laughs> <laughs> well, I only did that for the first one. I eased off on myself, and the second one I wrote between eight and nine a.m. Wow, that's such a like mathematical science. <laughs> <laughs> for the third one, like I wrote it very leisurely. It was it was like really, uh, you know, it was a lot of lingering mornings. But I found that if I try to write any time past ten a.m., uh, nothing came. So it had to so. Uh, between 9 a.m. and 10 a.m. seems to be my sweet spot. And, mm -hmm. you know, I miss my 20s. Like, I could sit at my computer for 18 hours. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably why I have a bad back now, but... Uh... <laughs> I wanted I want to talk about something that you brought up and that was how you grew up listening to trickster stories mm -hmm. and I find that really interesting that we have the same trickster like in Gitsan it's we get right oh and, really yeah oh, wow. and he he's like I've, I've had a like I didn't grow up learning about my culture in the same way that you did or listening to the stories um but I listened to some of them mm -hmm. and I always just he was just like such a jerk. Oh, I have a river because of that. But like that, like what's the lesson? And one of the things I've had trouble learning throughout my life as uh, like a modern Indigenous person yeah. is how to um, interpret our traditional stories, which are quite dark. Yeah. Um, some of our stories, yes. like telling them and understanding the meaning, it's like, how do we interpret that today as a meaning? And yes. I'm wondering how you see that, like how a lot of our our, our old stories are, are very dark and they have a meaning mm. that was situated for those times so long yes. ago. So, and I feel like you've managed to tell those stories in a modern way, so succinctly and relatable. Oh, thank and you. Is, was that a plan of yours? Was that something? Uh, that was that was a, a big part of the intention behind the Trickster series because you know my niece and nephew are having the same difficulty because you know my sister likes Mohawks, so um, she, likes what? she likes Mohawks. Yeah, so she's 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 out in ah. Brantford. <laughs> okay, that's <dark. laughs> She's, you know, it's it's pretty safe to date them because they're they're probably not cousins. <laughs> um, so you know, so dad was trying to tell my niece and nephews some some wicked stories, and they didn't have the context um, to they weren't laughing at them. And yeah, they were interested. Yeah. They were really interested, and they were trying. But you know, they didn't. They didn't grow up with the same things that I took for granted. So, a part of the intention of the Trickster series was to contextualize for them, like uh, some of the some of the easier uh, supernatural creatures, some of our mythology. Um, and incorporate like some some very easy, uh, you know, the the view of the world that you know wouldn't include like like some of the like really dark elements. Like there's uh, like any of the winter ceremony stuff. 
Um, you know, it was, everyone knows the songs, they know the dances. Um, and when you've grown up with it, uh, you know, it, it doesn't phase you because you, you know the context for it. But when you're trying to explain it to someone who doesn't know the context, um, they, they seem very brutal. Um, and I, I don't know how it is uh, with the gets in, but with, with the highs light, um, when I was first dealing with cultural material in Monkey Beach, it was completely new. Uh, my uncle Gordon had written uh, Tales of the Kitimat, and we had some cousins who were uh, publishing papers. Um, but before, before them, there were people who were writing about the Heisla and they were taking all these dark material and basically demonizing the Heisla for it. Mm. So when I started writing Monkey Beach, uh, it, was, it was a long process, partly because uh, I would never written a novel before. <laughs> I had no idea how to do it. Incredible. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and partly because uh, it was completely new territory. There was, there was, uh, I grew up surrounded by storytellers and they're amazing storytellers, but, um, you know, trying to fit our cosmology into a novel and still have it be respectful and still accessible to people who didn't grow up in the culture was very challenging. So very early in the process, I started consulting with my aunties and my cousins, uh, the ones who have like a, a deeper understanding of our culture than I do. Um, they have a good understanding, but there's a difference between me and the people who are holding the culture up. Um, those people are the people I go to. Um, and <laughs> I, 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 the Heisler are a little blunt. So um, uh, if, you, if you don't, you know, if you aren't expecting that, it, it can be uh, uh, disconcerting. But uh, when I was showing like an early draft of the potlet scene to my aunt, um, she asked me if I thought my culture was performative mm. or if I lived it. And mm. I was going, lived it? Oh. <laughs> 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 so all through the process of writing Monkey Beach, like there were a lot of hard conversations and uh, that really shaped what I put into the book and what I didn't put into the book. Um, mm -hmm. And when you're from a pot etching culture, there is a traditional copyright. Yes. Like there, yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. like the, the rest of the world, right? Yes. Too. Intellectual yes. property. Yes. And it's, it's very expensive. Like if I want to use like any of the stories that belongs to a, an, indiv an individual, a clan or the community, I'd have to throw a potlatch. So with, so I learned that through the process of writing Monkey Beach. And I applied that to the Trickster series by strictly sticking to the characters and mythology that were in the Heisla public domain. Mm -hmm. um, and not veering into any of the own stories, uh, right. not dealing with any of the territorial disputes or uh, any of the title disputes. Huh? <laughs> 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 I was like, no, we're just going to keep to a very simple uh, trickster story. And uh, we get also plays a lot of different roles in our culture. He's... Uh, He's also a showman in the winter ceremony. So I had to be careful not to use any of the elements from like, he goes, he's like the master of ceremonies. He, he goes out while the dancers are changing. 
mm. and and chats with the with the attendees. So you know any of those that I that was completely off limits. I wouldn't touch mm. any of that because wow. it's it's a part of that um, owned stories, the owned songs, the owned dances. Um, so everything in the Trickster series um, is, they, they belong to a set of stories that was meant to teach children our new uh, our, our handsome way of living. So those stories are always, anyone can tell them and they can add their own spin to them. Whereas with the formal stories, they are taught to specific people and those mm -hmm. people remember them exactly as they are told. And they have like a, a like a, a formal language that goes with it, like a formal Heisla. Um, so, you know, so that material, uh, uh, if I touch that material, I, I wouldn't share it with non Heisla people, whether you're indigenous right. or white, that would strictly be for the community. So mm -hmm. when I'm talking about writing like about the Heisla astronomers, that will be strictly for the community. Mm. Um, the trashy band council romance is for everyone though. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wanna, I'm like dying to know of, and I actually had to ask Leslie this because again, I, I'm not a big fiction reader. So I was like, is it off limits to ask her like where she got inspiration? Like I was dying to know about the organs. Like I found that so creepy, but also so WTF, you know, you know creepy. But I was like, is it a metaphor? Like I, I actually re-listened to it after I because I was listening to the audiobook. So I re-listened to it again and I was like, oh, this is like maybe a metaphor of, I don't know, I won't get into all my own personal. <laughs> And maybe you can explain for people who haven't finished reading. I guess it comes off right off the top. It's, it, yeah, it's like page two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the organ roundup in the Kitimat General Hospital. <laughs> uh, that was strictly from my imagination. Mm -hmm. um, that was that was my little addition to the trickster world. That was um, uh, that was something I saw very clearly. You know, of course, you know, of course this would happen. And, um, there were there were some like very vague references to uh, like the time, the ancient time where people could take off skins and put on different skins. Mm. And, um, you know, it was like when, when I was going, like I, I, one of my day jobs was I worked at the treaty archives. I was an archival assistant. My main job was to shred multiple copies. Like people would photocopy documents. Um, so we'd have like 20 photocopies of one of our documents. So my job was to keep the original and shred, shred all the copies of it so that we could condense. Um, I found, you know, I found it Fascinating. <laughs> but, you know, one of the older mentions of um, like someone's like liver expanding to become a skin, um, it, it wasn't, it wasn't a Heisla story. It was something someone had heard. And um, that just, that stuck in my brain um very very early in the process I knew I wanted to have an escaping organ scene <laughs> <laughs> just to keep it light <laughs> yeah <laughs> and I like I like to keep those like the the crazy bits at the beginning just so that you know like this is this is the world you're entering and it's it's okay if you're you know uh if it's not your cup of tea, but you know, <laughs> if you can get past the organ roundup. <laughs> I, I 
loved how you had elders like swearing. <laughs> and like, a like, I was like, oh, like my heart. I actually had a, a like white TV personality condemn me for oh. not being professional. And I was like, come on. Like, this is. <laughs> I don't even I don't even know how to defend myself with that, but reading your book, like, yes, these are our aunties, these are our people swearing. Come on. I I thought the F bomb was an adjective. So <laughs> like I, I went to when I was first starting out at the University of Victoria, you didn't drop, I just was casually dropping F bombs everywhere. <laughs> Cause that's what I grew up with. <laughs> It was a different time. So um, uh, there are some very, very creative swearers in my family. Have uh, you had pushback from that, from readers or even like your own family or your community about like how you're representing your people to, to like a mainstream audience? Um, I, I've had pushback uh, about specific scenes like um, there were a couple of people <laughs> who didn't like the frosting scene in Son of a Trickster where there was like a cookie monster decoration uh, placed somewhere uh, so <laughs> there was a pushback on that yes there was there was there was some blowback mostly um you know, I'm, I'm, uh, Lord, I'm 53. And like back in the seventies and the eighties, um, you know, even into the nineties, like the, like I grew up, uh, surrounded by residential school survivors. So the stories that I was hearing when I was growing up were, um, very frank um and the risk you know we're uh, you know i went to a uh, day school mm -hmm. um so the you know the different levels of dealing with all the after effects of these events um and you know when i was going through high school like uh there was no veiled racism <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it was it was pretty frank. <laughs> uh, so you know, so there was in that much more brutal world. Yeah. Um, there was, you know, you had to have an aggressive response. And that sort of bled into a, a very casual approach to violence and swearing. Um so it's, it's very much a part of a lived experience. Mm. And I found it, uh, you know, interesting that people were put off by the swearing. But, uh, you know, I, I tend to tune out things I'm not interested in. <laughs> so I just ignored it. <laughs> I, <laughs> this is the world I created. And, you know, yeah. it's, it's just, yeah. Live with it. I can I can play in it any way I want. <laughs> and you, you're such a like huge inspiration for Indigenous people who want to become writers. Like I remember uh, when you and Lee Miracle were like just kind of on that edge of like you know like it, there was no space for us, and now yeah. there's just so much more, yeah. and it's great to see. Yeah. And I'm wondering, given you know, you, you have sort of been a part of pushing that um, amplification or that space um, mm -hmm. for Indigenous writers, young and old. Um, what advice do you have for writers who are just getting started and wanting to, to be at the place where you have, where you're so successful, you've written so many books and you're lauded as a great Canadian or international writer even. Well, thank you. Well, I remember at the beginning of my career and whenever there was an, 
you know, an indigenous news story, uh, I was asked for my takes on it. And, you know, when I see the young authors being asked again and again for their takes on an indigenous stories, um, you know, you, you don't have to you know, respond to everything. You don't have to react to everything. Um, you know, sometimes it would be obviously inappropriate for me to comment on something like, I know nothing about Mi'kmaq fishing. So mm. uh, having my take on it would not be very helpful. Um, you know, when I first wanted to write about missing and murdered indigenous women, um, you know, I was very fortunate to be surrounded by uh, some very gentle elders who were asking me, um, you know, there are so many people who lived this experience um, and their voices aren't being heard. So mm. what are you bringing to the conversation besides being indigenous and a woman? Mm. And, uh, and then there were the aunties who were a little more frank. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so you know um so just because there's an expectation that you're going to be an indigenous expert doesn't mean that's the role you have to accept hmm. like when you're choosing like your material um there are a lot of people who won't understand the complex dynamics of being indigenous on Turtle Island. Like there's, there's vast differences between the cultures. There's vast differences between the age groups. Um, so you can comment on the things that you're comfortable commenting on. Mm. You, know, you, you can tell the stories you want to tell. Do you, when you're writing, do you care who your audience is? Like, are you thinking this is for my people or are you thinking like, how will a non-Indigenous person perceive that? Are you thinking about those questions about who's reading your work? I, I'm not good at uh, like abstract concepts of audience. I found that like every single thing that I've written, um, I've had to write it to a specific person. Hmm. Like Monkey Beach was written for a specific auntie. Like oh, wow. when I was writing it, I was telling it to her and to her alone. Wow. Um, you know, the Trickster series was written to a specific cousin. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I could only tell the story if, you know, I could only shape it if it was to that person. So um, the fact that the Trickster series, you know, found a wide audience is, is still kind of shocking because um, I was expecting like the, like I really do have like a hardcore fan base of 500 cousins mm -hmm. and they just buy and read everything. Oh, so that's, you know, that's who I'm picturing as my audience uh, and everyone else that, that came on board. It's, you know, it's been a, it's been wonderful. And um, I, yeah, I, I'm still blown away. Um, I, I want to ask you so many different questions, I but I have to ask this because I, I, it was kind of interesting because I was, and I won't get into this, but just to like tell you, I was at the bank and I was listening to the audio book and one of the, I won't say who it is either, but one of the characters came on and I was like, that's my dad. <laughs> Like, sounds like my grandfather's name. And then I was like, I don't know. No. Anyways, but then the whole time was like, Jared, like, where did that inspiration come from? Because he's he's such an interesting character. Like, he's yeah. so kind of like, yeah, whatever. But he's so strong and powerful yeah. and a descendant of something powerful. But yeah. he's just like any other, you know, teen or young adult that you would know on the res or in the city. Um, that I think so many Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people could relate to as well. Where did he yeah. come from? 
I he was he was he, he was always his own character but a lot of like the specific habits and you know the details of the way he'd react were were things I I picked from different people but you know when I was when I uh Monkey Beach got onto the um onto this pilot program with Finesk uh trying to get into the First Nations English 11 and 12 classes and uh when it was first starting I I supported it by doing like these insane little tours of high schools in the north Mm. yeah and I met so many Jareds like there's there's a lot of really good kids in really hard situations and you know that their lives are still you know they're still full of joy they're still you know they're still doing their best even though um, you know, they have everything going against them. And, you know, they were a huge inspiration for Jared. Mm. Um, we're going to go to some audience, uh, some audience questions. And we have one right now from Donnie, who asks, are any of these characters, and this is kind of relating to what I just said about, mm-hmm. about Jared, um, any of these characters or scenes, that's a big question, based on your own life or your own experience? Oh my goodness. Well, Aunt Maeve, I totally stole from me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> just the de- just the details of the way like a, a, a writer would like, you know, function and uh, uh, if someone came and, you know, told me that they were a trickster, I don't think I'd, uh, you know, so uh, <laughs> and the apartment, the uh, Aunt Maeve's apartment is, uh, uh, it, it's an actual uh, Luma Native Housing on Gravely oh, Street. It's, okay. it's it's my best friend's apartment. Uh, I've couch surfed there a lot, so I know like the layout very well. Um, and I asked her before I put it in the book. <laughs> um, yeah, no, my mom's fam, uh, my grand uh, and my great aunt followed the the cannery work down. Uh, in the 70s and every summer we'd we take the Greyhound down to visit them uh, so I know East Vancouver uh, very well and uh, yeah I think she lived it like she lived in uh, the American when they first moved down the um, American the American yeah they, wow. they, seat in the, they seat in the yeah, yeah. wow that yeah. would be loud to live in yeah <laughs> The bar, the bar the <laughs> uh the Belmoral, the Empress. Wow, um, all the places. Then, yeah, then down, then down on Ray Cam, and then uh and then when Native Housing started opening up, they uh you know, Cran was in the, the building uh near commercial on Broadway, like the the elders building with like the weirdly shaped apartments. Um, and, and I just remember it, like sleeping on a lot of like tiny couches. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have another question from Carla, um, who says, love how you say that you write each piece for one person. I agree. Um, do they know this ahead of time? Is there added pressure when they read the finished product? Great question, Carla. Oh, well, um, uh, sometimes they do and sometimes they don't like my auntie knew and she was right read- she was reading all the drafts hmm. um, and she was reading specific scenes so um but the cousin I wrote the trickster story for has just started them um yeah if he he was uh yeah you know not a not a big reader um and uh but then people, you know, other families started talking about them and he felt left out. So <laughs> do you like if they're like, I don't like how this person is presented, do you change stuff? Or has that happened? Oh, oh it's happened a lot. Wow. Um, yeah. And you know, we chatted out. And it, it depends on the reason. Um and a lot of times, <laughs> uh, like they were like the comments for the 
third book were mostly, they were disappointed that Jared and Sarah didn't get together. Hmm. Like, you know, and I was like, well, she's, you know, I think she's pretty well done. I think she's, you know, in her mind, they're just friends. I think Jared wants more, but, you know, hmm. because of everything that happened, I think they'll have a deep friendship but but they'll never be boyfriend girlfriend again and she's yeah. you know she's on a completely different journey like she is full, has fully embraced magic so jared still wants to be a medical sonographer <laughs> did become now i've got to listen to the whole thing again <laughs> anyway uh, question three audrey from audrey um are the koi wolves quote in parentheses, the bad guys, supernatural beings in your culture, or where did they come from? I am yeah. guessing they are more um, than just coyote wolf hybrids. hybrids. The, the koi wolves are very new. And, um, you know, dad always said that uh, when they had the wolf calls, like when, you know, they were killing off their elders, Mm. And their elders were the people that taught them, you know, right from wrong. They were the people that showed them how to live a good life. Um, so some of the wolves that survived that didn't grow up doing right from wrong. So they do some, uh, you know, they do some bad things. And um, with the you know with the koi wolves uh it's a similar story like the 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 wolves didn't have enough options for partners so you know they were they were going with coyotes they were going with dogs um and the hybrids didn't fit into any of the world so they weren't socialized the way wolves were traditionally socialized um and that was that was my dad's way of seeing the the new hybrids and the young wolves that were that were acting very strangely. He said, you know, mm. as long as as long as you respect them, they're they're not a you know they're going to respect you. Uh, but you know, the second they see you weak. <laughs> But if you break your ankle, <laughs> you know, and that is their role. Like they're, mm -hmm. they're taking out the weak. So if, mm -hmm. you know, that's, it's, it's a part of the way the world really is. It's mm -hmm. not, it's not a part of like a, like a, a human way of thinking of the world. It's, it's a part of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's that's our baggage, not theirs. Mm. Um, so, that. so when I was thinking about the koi wolves and about you know they would grow up socialized very different, and they'd be um, outcasts in in a lot of the different like wolf societies and the coyote societies. So, um, that's you know, the stories that I grew up hearing that like, you know, there's, you know, every, every animal has their own way of organizing themselves. Mm. And mm. they have their own traditions, they have their own songs, they have their own potlatches. Um, we just don't know them because, you know, we, we don't really socialize with them. Mm -hmm. And so that's the approach I took for the trickster series. Mm. Um, let's go to another question. We have one from Victoria who says about your writing process, what mm -hmm. is your plotting process like? Do you prefer to plot ahead or see where the story takes you? Uh, I, um, uh, I cook like I write with abandon. Uh, <laughs> so there's a lot of cleanup afterwards. <laughs> Uh, I have, I really admire writers who work from an outline and who know exactly where their stories are going. Uh, I find that doesn't work for me. So the, what I use is just, you know, pour everything down. It's out of order. It's out of sync sequence. You know, the characters shift 
a lot. Uh, I named them different things three times just because mm. I, you know, didn't catch some of them with the search and replace. Um, you know, so the, the first drafts are always really ugly. <laughs> <laughs> and then I take them apart. And, um, you know, no matter like how much you outline, you're still going to have to do like a, uh, like a restructuring. Some mm. people will have a more extensive process like me, and some people will just have um, more of like continuity issues. Mm. Uh, it, it really depends on your personality and what your muse likes. Like uh, any of the processes that other writers tell you uh, are completely useless if they don't work. Mm -hmm. So try out different things. Like, you know, different authors will suggest different ways of getting around like writer's block. Um, and the right way is the way that creates pages. Mm. So if you find yourself stuck and someone's advice isn't working, then you can put it aside. It's, it's just not the method that works for you. Mm. I, I, before I move on to the qu next question, I just wanna say, I love that because <laughs> I was always taught like the way that I'm doing things is so messy and disorganized and I'm trying to pass down and impart to, to young writers, like you just said so beautifully, like the way that you do things and the way that you get through the pages is the way yeah. that you get through the pages. But, yeah. Well, well um, are, you, are you working on a book now? Yeah. What are you working on? Um, murder. Oh. oh, wow. Is it fiction or nonfiction? Nonfiction. Nice. Oh my goodness. Um, how do you, how do you deal with like, like when there are heavy moments in the book? Yeah. So actually what was really kind of like interesting about reading your book at this time because mm -hmm. I'm going deep into these two murders that I'm very attached to mm -hmm. even spiritually wow and this one that I'm on right now it's it's I've always felt very spiritually connected to and I just had to speak to a relative of the potential person who potentially murdered and that was really wow. interesting because it was, oh, it was just going into like all that trauma, right? And they're yeah. all indigenous from all up, like all of our Northwest Coast relatives, right? And just your book was like healing in that way, right? It's like mm -hmm. pulling apart all the pieces and, and healing it. And yeah, so the way that I deal with it is... Um, I mean, I think the best way for me to deal with that is to pick up the phone and phone a close girlfriend and just yeah. lay it all out because yeah. it's so dark yeah. and it's so heavy and um, you need to have like somebody who gets it because mm -hmm. I find like, especially a lot of non-Indigenous people who don't understand the supernatural or yeah. what that means to us and this the spiritual, you need to have family or friends who can go like, totally, I get that. Yeah. Like, yes, that makes sense. Totally get that. And yeah, so like, sorry, this is like not about me. No, now. no, 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 no. This, this is, this is, yeah. No, but it I was have... interesting reading yeah. your book because it was like, oh my God, these worlds are colliding and like, <laughs> it's, it, but, but it was okay. Like it was mm -hmm. like, this is healing for our people. And yeah. we've just been through so much trauma yeah. And we need creative ways to output that, like yeah. your book, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and that darkness, I think, for people who've been through this trauma, like mm -hmm. we need to like go through all of that and like yeah. and like see the metaphors in it, and then yeah. see, yeah, I don't know. Then I'm gonna go way too deep into it. No, but, no, that's yeah. um, yeah. like for for trap lines, uh, the very first collection of short stories. Uh, I was pretty goth and emo at that time. And, you know, I was processing like a lot of dark material. And it was, you know, I would have been lost without my sister. Like that was like, yeah, yeah she was, she was my sounding board. Um, and she'd make me laugh 
And uh, so, yeah, so having someone that you can, you know, that, that you can go to when, yeah, yeah, that, it's, it's just amazing. Yeah. And that's such an important thing I find like a lot of young Indigenous journalists or writers constantly ask me like how do you process the trauma and that's mm -hmm. such a new thing like yeah. no one asked us that before <laughs> we were just like you're tough like you can deal with more than anybody else and now it's like oh wow like they've been through a lot <laughs> like, maybe they should too. <laughs> and, and I love that I love being like oh yeah like going for walks yeah. is okay like yeah. going through nature is okay um, but let's let's get back to the question. Amazing and healing Eden Robinson is. Um, but uh, we have a question from uh, Maritza who says, "How did the House of the Sasquatch come together?" I love this question. I love this part. I did too. <laughs> Having them all living at home was really interesting. She says. Yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, I, my niece and nephew love snowboarding. So, uh, <laughs> I was like, what? This guy owns real estate? <laughs> uh, so I spent a lot of time in Whistler. Like we, mm. we spent, uh, um, let's see, what year was that? Was it? That was, that was quite a while ago. It feels like it was forever, but it was probably only three years. <laughs> Thank you, pandemic. <laughs> um, so I have a terrible sense of direction. Uh, so we were caught up and, you know, I was constantly driving us through like neighborhoods that we, you know, that were exactly the opposite of where we needed to go. Like, uh, like my dad was a hunter and a fisherman and a trapper and a logger. So he was always like, he, he couldn't understand how I didn't know which direction was north. Uh, and, you know, so I had prepared myself. I had like the map, the maps on my phone and then I had a GPS thing and we would still get lost. Like, well, I would still get lost. And um, my poor family. <laughs> so, um, so, but I got to see like a, a lot of different neighborhoods and there was this house that was for sale. And um, so my sister said, well, look it up on like a, like the, the real, the realtor's website. So that was the, the Sasquatch's house. And uh, I grew up with a lot of stories about like the, the chief tree spirits. And I just always loved them. I thought they were, I thought they were wonderful. So I wanted to put a chief tree spirit there. Um, and then oh, I was, that. yeah, they, they were, they were just, um, yeah, and then we then we let's see, uh, but yeah, no, it was my dad. He's <laughs> he's a huge fan of Bogues, the the wild men of the woods, and um, yeah, he said that they don't visit us anymore because they built a mall, and they're <laughs> too busy shopping. <laughs> and that's why I did acid and mushrooms as well. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'll just say it. That's the guy that reminded me of my dad. Oh, but then, you were like, then you were like, and he owns real estate. And I was like, no, that's not my dad. I've never met him for sure. <laughs> he was, he, it was hard to rein him in. Like he was, he was like, uh, yeah, he, he just, he was one of those like really flamboyant characters that just, uh, he was a scene stealer. So the request that I've had from readers to him so far has been, we'd like to see him in the 70s with Weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, it's a lot of mushrooms and acid. Huh? <laughs> yeah, because him and, him and Anita really were the fighty res couple that yeah. everyone kind of rolled their eyes when they came into the party and went, oh God. <laughs> Let's go to another question um, from Suzanne. Who inspired you to turn oral story culture into novels, if it's that? Um, mm -hmm. Did you have a beloved writer? So this is kind of two questions now. 
Do you know if you are a mentor? Do you know if you are a mentor to an up and coming indigenous writer? Yeah, so that's kind of three questions. I guess like, so the first one is, who inspired you to turn oral story culture into novels? Um, uh, Coming from a family of storytellers is hard when you don't have the same gift. So um, I have a very hoppy brain. So I'll be telling a story and then I'll remember like something that I read today. Um, it's like, you know, there's, there's a planet that's hotter than most suns like around like the star that's really close. And so I would have started off telling you the story about the clam clans, but then you know, did a quick dip into hot Jupiters. And then that reminded me of an article that I read about magnetars. And everyone's like, okay, yeah, that's a good <laughs> story. <laughs> so knowing that I'm not as talented as like some of my family, it was such a relief to come to writing because I can edit out all those asides. <laughs> So it's, it's so it's it's a way of telling stories that uh, that I can do. Um, it's it's an adaptation that allows me to be like a part of the storytelling, and so that's a gift. Um, mm. I, it's it's not something that, uh, yeah, I, I didn't. Yeah, it it wasn't a process of like I want to tell these oral stories for everybody you know it's all no it was it was more I want to tell stories too (laughs) I love that everyone has their own way yeah yeah Um, yeah the other part of the question was do you have a beloved writer someone that inspires you oh I have many beloved writers um and right now uh, I, I'm reading Lisa Bird Wilson's new novel, and uh, <laughs> uh, she is hilarious. Oh my god! It, it, it is. Uh, I, there, there's so many like young writers coming up right now, and you know they're just they're just hitting it out of the park. It's amazing. Mm. Uh, it, it's like it's like. Um, uh, you know, rain in a desert. It's just, you know, it's been, mm. uh, it, it's, it's so invigorating. Mm. I, I'm really, really enjoying this part of. Yeah. Uh, this. Uh, we have another question from Tracy who says, in Monkey Beach, does Lisa Marie live in the end? Mm. Is the reason there is no sequel because she actually died? Hmm. What do you think? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it is it uh, when I was growing up uh, there were a lot of books that we were assigned to read where they would tell you exactly what happened and they would force feed you the moral and mm. um, I never liked that um, I I wanted you to be able to to bring it to enough closure uh, but to leave it open to the reader's imagination. And I always love hearing what people come up with. Like um, uh, one of my, (laughs) and to be clear, every single person in my family hated that ending. (laughs) This is is not the way you end our stories. (laughs) Uh, So they asked me to never do that again. Um, So it's, it's a bit more resolved in the trickster series, but they, mm. yeah, blood sports, not so much. Uh, mm. But the, yeah, I, w- I was, yeah, I, I love open endings. I, I understand mm. how frustrating they are. I understand the need for resolution. But, uh, you know, I started writing by writing fan fiction. So uh, you can, you can write like your own ending to Monkey Beach as you would like it to be. I had a question um, earlier that I, I, I posed on Twitter, um, which was just what question would you love? And there was like probably a hundred questions that they, people wanted to ask you. Mm-hmm. But one of them that I thought was really interesting was 
what advice do you wish you had never taken or maybe which advice are you glad you never took? I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, I was highly, highly influenced uh, by the social realists and um, uh, you know, I, I'm looking back on the first book where, you know, I would argue for hours about semicolons, um, you know, but I was very earnest back then. I wish, um, you know, I had, you know, there when you were very passionate about certain things, like I, I wish I hadn't been so passionate about punctuation. <laughs> there were a lot of unnecessary arguments about, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, I was solidly an APA girl and mm-hmm. I did not like Oxford and I, I still don't like MLA. But, you know, as I've gotten older, you know, I, I'm much more relaxed about punctuation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm willing to try new things now. <laughs> yeah. There's a there's a guy that I know, um, Patrick. Now I can't remember his last name, um, but he wrote his entire PhD with no punctuation. Ooh, ooh, that's a bold choice. But yeah, I read a I read a poetry collection where instead of punctuation, they were using backslashes. Um, and el- the ellipses oh. were very strange. Yeah. I think that's what he did, the backslashes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Amazing. But yeah. um, there's another question that says, <laughs> mentioned you started by writing fan fiction. Mm-hmm. The audience wants to know details. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was very set on becoming an astronaut. Uh, really? <laughs> Yes, very, very, very set on it. So I took the sciences, like it was, it was, uh, I was in the, uh, the astronomy club, the chess club, the math club. Um, But then I discovered uh, NASA had a height limit, you had to be at least five, three. Uh, (laughs) So I spent grade 10 completely heartbroken. Uh, and at the time I was going through like my horror phase, like it was a lot of uh, uh, Stephen King, uh, Clive Barker, uh, mm. Eric McCormick, and at that time, uh, Cronenberg. And one of my favorite shows was Scanners. So you had a lot of angsty teens who could explode your head with the power of their mind. And one of my English teachers read out my exploding head story and the class really liked it it was the very first time in my life anyone ever considered me cool uh and <laughs> what grade were you in? uh that would have been great yeah grade 10 the end of grade 10 wow. and uh it was addictive so i wrote a lot of exploding head stories <laughs> <laughs> i don't think any of them uh, I don't think any of them have survived. Like we had a basement flood. So, and they didn't make it into the yearbook. Um, my angsty poetry did make it into a lot of the yearbooks. Like uh, he left me, I think I'm going to die. All I do is cry, cry, cry. <laughs> I think you've come a long way just in <laughs> Yeah, someone, someone came to my reading and they had that yearbook with like that, you know, I was also doing photography. So there's like a bear tree and then the poem beside it. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, you're going to make me sign it, aren't you? <laughs> I acknowledge grade 10 Eden. <laughs> We, we don't have we don't have any more questions but I'm like this is totally off whatever the beaten track but what's your favorite Clive Barker novel that was my favorite too when I was growing oh, up oh the books of blood like mm. the especially the one 
um the one that haunted me the longest was like that that festival where they um the oh, people yeah. form the monster and the, oh, some of yeah. them some of them at the bottom are getting squashed was that like a Maginica or something like yes, that? yes yes yeah. yes and um the the Marilyn Monroe one that was I remember yeah. the post office one it's really yes. weird this is so long ago oh my god I know I know I was I was um uh, let's see uh and I remember you know one of one of my elementary teachers brought in Eric McCormick <laughs> and the like the last blast of the I can't remember what the book was anymore but he read a story where like the clocks were melting and you know yeah. I, it was it was just you know I uh, you know that was like one of the highlights of that class for me and um I don't think other people enjoyed it quite as much as I did <laughs> well one thing I've learned from your book is just like the importance of going to those dark places mm. and the richness of that and just yeah I just want to thank you because I like I said I haven't read fiction for so long and it just I mean in terms of like my own writing like that helps me with like so many things but it gives you just I don't know a sense of escape but also a mm -hmm. sense of like richness in your life that you can't see in this world thank you Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think uh, I, you know, I'm very grateful to be a writer because, you know, I get to process uh, my world through writing. Uh, I don't know how non-writers process the world. Like the pandemic can be pretty overwhelming. Mm. And, you know, when you're, when you are a witness to such horror, uh, it can be pretty disempowering. Um, so one of the ways that I deal with, you know, the strange and dark places that, you know, that I see is, is through writing. And it, you know, it helps clarify in my own head uh, things that I don't quite know how to deal with. And sometimes it, transforms the moment but mostly it's a, an acknowledgement that you know uh, like when you're a witness at a potlatch you know you are there to tell you are there to see things the way they are and to tell the truth uh, whenever anyone asks you what happened and that's how I view fiction um, but I'm also very geeky and I like things like the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy <laughs> and Clive Barker. So it's, it's a huge mesh of like all the things that are in my floating around my head. Mm. Well, I think we're, we're coming to an end, but I thank you so to, much. Thank you. No, like, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> thank you both. <laughs> we love That's you. Been... Yeah, you're our favorite. I said to somebody, or I said, on, no, I, I wrote a shout out to you on Twitter. This is a little while ago that you're mm -hmm. like the world's favorite auntie. And someone was like, she's not old enough to be an auntie. And I'm like, look, man, in indigenous, <laughs> like in our people's world, you can be like, tan and be an auntie so <laughs> sometimes you know you're older than your nieces and nephews yeah sometimes you're not <laughs> but yeah it's been an honor to talk to you what an amazing conversation thank you i mean oh, thank you thank you and if you need anyone to read your first draft um, that's a good offer that's a that's an amazing offer yeah yeah i would be touched Angela Eden, thank you so much for this conversation tonight. I really enjoyed reading the chats that were coming in. Um, everybody's just super happy to be listening to both of you tonight. Um, Eden, congratulations on Return of the Trickster. And this book is available in your favorite bookstore or at your favorite library. So do get out there, buy the book, read the book. And um, Eden, I hope you'll come visit us on stage back at the Vancouver Writers Festival when we can gather again in those ways. 
because we'd love to give you a standing ovation and cheer Aww. for you this way. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you both. Thank, Thank you, you to our wonderful audience for tuning in tonight. Our next Insight event is on March the 31st, and we will be hosting Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Michael Moss, who's written a book called Hooked on food and free will and uh, American food gi giants and how they exploit our addictions. Uh, he'll be in conversation with Angela Wu from the Globe and Mail. So please tune in for that. Again, Eden and Angela, thank you so much. We're really glad you could be here tonight. <laughs> Good night, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thanks, Vancouver Public Library. Thank you. Oh. Oh, shoot. oh, I almost left. Oh, and I'm completely serious. That sounds amazing. Me? Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, 